Hi, my name is Stephen Leeds, and I want to thank the committee for allowing me to do this presentation on the management of a high esophageal diverticulum. For my disclosures, I do consult for Ethicon, uh, which currently manufactures the Lynx device, but has no relevance to this talk. A little bit of background, this is uh, about epiphrenic diverticulum, which is a pulsion type diverticulum, uh, and is almost always as a result of a motility disorder. And the most common motility disorder being achalasia, which in itself is rare, uh, depending where you read, between one in every 10,000 uh, patients or one in 100,000 patients, which makes an esophageal diverticulum a very rare occurrence. Um, and it's about 5% of achalasia patients have an esophageal diverticulum. In the literature, there's uh, one paper that I found that's more on the recent side of, of a full institutional uh, retrospective review of abdominal versus thoracic approaches, which is really what my question was. Um, this paper had two groups, a uh, total of 30 patients, 12 in an abdominal uh, group and 18 in a thoracic group. And these were base, basically under time frames, but these were open procedures, uh, whether they were laparotomy or thoracotomy, uh, basically had about the same length of stay, but their abdominal group had no leaks versus the thoracic group having a 17% leak rate when um, eventually a 22 or 23% reoperative rate for a leak after diverticulectomy. Furthermore, a literature review of the traditional uh, open surgeries versus a minimally invasive approach by Rossetti et al. Uh, and they looked at the thoracotomies early on, which is the chart on the left, uh, showing a lot of diverticula diverticulectomy and myotomy with a morbidity that was um, usually from a leak, uh, some other complications there, uh, rare mortality, but overall the outcomes were fairly uh, decent. Now they compared that to a more modern approach was a minimally invasive, usually using thoracoscopy and laparoscopy. Uh, a lot more patients in this um, cohort uh, where they were showing a little bit higher of a leak rate, um, one uh, or two as a conversion rate, but their success on the right were uh, equally as good, indicating that uh, it was potentially safe to go on with this minimally invasive approach, which really brings us to the era we are in now. So uh, they showed the abdominal approach was investigated, there was less morbidity, um, one thing they pointed out, which is going to be important, is that it was easier to access the myotomy, uh, especially extending it down onto the stomach. Um, but they didn't talk about an indication on which one to use, whether it was thoroscopic or laparoscopic, and maybe when to use it. And so that brought me to my question. So there was nothing out there about which approach to use and when. And so um, this is when I approached the Facebook uh, um, private group. And so here was my post. Um, basically, I just threw it out there that I, I really just wanted to understand um, how high everybody thought they can go laparoscopically to get a diverticulum. Um, and then I said, I have an older patient with a proximal opening, which is about 10 centimeters from the G junction. And that was um, calculated endoscopically. And I really get anxiety about getting in there doing this uh, dissection and then not being able to get high enough to get a stapler in there, which means you eventually have to get the stapler even higher than the proximal uh, border because of the, um, the staple zone on the actual staple, you have to get it up fairly high. Um, and the other thing that I think poses a significant problem in these patients is that there is no hiatal hernia generally. I mean, rarely do we see achalasia patients present with a hiatal hernia. So when you're doing this laparoscopically transabdominally, you're you're looking into the mediastinum through a much smaller hiatus and it makes it very difficult to see these diverticulum uh, high up in the mediastinum. And so ultimately I got about 13, uh, I got 13 surgeons interacting with me um, and there was a few areas that were really educational from my standpoint and that were brought up was really the recommendations on the workup, um, how to plan the approach, laparoscopic and then robotic came up, uh, which we'll talk about more and then the thoroscopic and then Really, the, the judgment for which approach to use was really what the, the topic uh, of the uh, discussion was. And so the recommendations of the workup, I mean, you need an esophagram, absolutely. That's usually how they're diagnosed. 
uh, we talked about obtaining a CT chest, uh, needing manometry, you want to identify your spastic disorder or your motility disorder, um, and then you need an EGD to, to look at uh, the size of the diverticulum, uh, look for any masses, any mucosal abnormalities, and really I think that's probably your best way to measure uh, the distance from the distal um, aspect down to the G junction or the hiatus. So the esophagram again shows the location, usually the way it's diagnosed, um, and then the size of the mouth on the side of the diverticulum. I mean, you really want to understand um, what you're going in there after and, and how big of a diverticulum you're, you're going to uh, encounter. And then the CT chest, we really talked a lot about this, was uh, really the relationship to the inferior pulmonary vein. Um, and then you also need the CT chest to ensure that you have no mass, uh, eliminating a traction diverticulum. And so here's the CT scan from the actual uh, patient that I was inquiring about. You can see the diverticulum in the CT scan uh, at or maybe uh, just slightly above the inferior pulmonary vein. Um, and then you can see the swallow exam or the esophagram uh, on the right there and you can see uh, its distance from the GE junction. So the location of the diverticulum uh, is very important where it is. Um, typically there's no hiatal hernia making the hiatus small, which I've, I've mentioned. And, and really the location is based on the inferior pulmonary vein proximity. If it's completely below the vein, an abdominal approach uh, probably is more appropriate or can be obtained. And then above the vein, likely a thoracic approach is more appropriate. So here's two pictures. The top picture you can see uh, a diverticulum that I dissected out was, uh, this is not the case at, uh, of question here, but this is another case where I dissected this out. It was a beautiful dissection. It was not too uh, far from the G junction. You can see there maybe three to four centimeters um, and it was easily stabled off. Um, the bottom one is a full seven, eight centimeter dissection, which is below the diaphragm. And still you can just barely see the diverticulum up in the mediastinum and the small hiatus. And so uh, they're very different operations and um, the surgery was uh, much different. So the advice from the post, um, we recommend a relationship to the inferior pulmonary vein. Three surgeons really kind of talked about that. Uh, one surgeon really harped on the, the CT and how, uh, how to evaluate that. Um, ask, uh, two surgeons asked for the manometry to, to, re to really understand the motility disorder. Um, and then it looked like the recommendation for my patient was a thoracic approach, which nine of the 13 surgeons talked about. Um, and some of them were talking, you know, this is near the carina, which is based on the 10 centimeter measurement. Uh, it would be very difficult to get uh, transabdominally or transhiatally. And then um, one further thing that I didn't really think about was inquiring about the myotomy plan. Um, and three surgeons really were kind of talking about that, what disorder you have, how high you're gonna do the myotomy uh, and so forth. So which pro approach was necessary? And so I think I've pretty much got it now where you know, it's based on the CT evidence uh, in relation to the inferior pulmonary vein. If the upper border is below, the upper border of the diverticulum is below, the inferior pulmonary vein, the abdominal approach is reasonable. If the upper border is above the inferior pulmonary vein, then it should be thoracoscopic approach. The CT scan recommendation, you need the CT scan. I would recommend PO and IV contrast, helps you get the best picture, especially if you are trying to rule out a mass. Um, it'll show you the relationship. You wanna see that inferior pulmonary vein uh, well, and then it'll, it'll rule out any traction diverticulum the manometry confirms your motility disorder. These are almost always with a motility disorder, uh, especially if it's a pulsion diverticulum. Uh, because achalasia is the most common, that's where you're gonna find them, but they can be found in jackhammer. Uh, and I wrote something else because uh, some of the older literature cite uh, DES, this, this diffuse esophageal spasm, uh, as well as nutcracker esophagus. And then this will also help you plan the length of the myotomy and maybe even the approach to the myotomy. So for my case, given the location, we recommended a thoracic approach. We presumed it again to be 10 centimeters above the hiatus, which was gonna to be too far to reach laparoscopically. And then given the discussion of a robotic approach, there's not really any data on this uh, compared to laparoscopy, but um, it does appear that it, it may provide some better visualization and ergonomics deep in the hiatus, uh, which may help you extend uh, the uh, distance at which you can get up into the mediastinum a little more.
I think the emphasis on the myotomy plan is really what I uh, came back to where traditionally the myotomy needs to be to the, to the level of the diverticulum um, and extend through the lower esophageal sphincter onto the stomach. Um, but with the introduction of pole, maybe you can integrate this into your, into your um, algorithm uh, using POEM for the diverticulum. For instance, um, you know, if, if uh, extending onto the stomach is difficult from a thoracic approach, you can do the POEM, go all the way down, and then thoracoscopically resect the diverticulum. Um, and so POEM does add um, some uh, additional benefit here. Um, however, there was a paper uh, and kind of this new discussion about, do you really need the diverticulectomy? I mean, there is some literature uh, leaving it with a myotomy, but now with the poem, you can pretty much go completely minimally invasive and incisionless um, and potentially doing the myotomy only. And, and this uh, paper here talked about 298 patients undergoing poem uh, for achalasia, and 14 of them had uh, esophageal diverticulum. Um, and when they just did the poem, uh, no diverticulectomy, the median Eckert score went from five to zero, the IRP went from 22 to normal. Um, and they only had one patient that complained of GERD symptoms. And so here was their figures pre and post. You can see uh, on the top left, you can see the tight lower esophageal sphincter. And then after it's been myotomized, you can see it on the right. Also, you can see the manometry, the spasm is essentially gone, or the pressurization is essentially gone. Uh, and then on the right, you can see the esophagram. Now, the diverticulum is still there. It still does fill with contrast, but you can see the outflow is, is much better. Uh, into the stomach. And so in conclusion, for management of esophageal diverticulum, you need an EGD, a CT chest, and I would recommend with PO and IV contrast, uh, manometry to identify your motility disorder and esophagram to really characterize your diverticulum. The inferior pulmonary vein is the landmark for judging the approach. And the abdominal approach seems to make the myotomy easier. Uh, there could be some promise with the robotic approach extending that uh, cephalad uh, dissection a little bit more in the mediastinum from the transhiatal position, uh, which needs to be investigated. And then maybe you don't need a diverticulectomy at all, which is really a lot of the morbidity and mortality from leaks. Uh, and there's some promise there. And so I'd like to thank you uh, for giving the opportunity to present.